Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorene Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is an old friend and colleague, Trip Jennings. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you're an award-winning veteran journalist. You're the executive director of something called New Mexico In-Depth. Tell us what that is. It is, um, we have our own website, nmindepth.com. But we also have media partnerships with various newspapers, the Las Cruces Sun News, uh, the Santa Fe New Mexican with KUNM um, NPR affiliate station in Albuquerque. And what we do is we, tr- we try to do in-depth reporting, and some of our reporting appears in these media partnerships. Uh, uh, we also have a partnership with the Santa Fe Reporter. Um, so our stories will appear all over. It's multimedia. It's print. It's radio. Sometimes we do audio. We're starting to post stuff on KME, the PBS station in um, in Albuquerque. So we're we're trying to really expand our reach and get our stories out there. And because in the 21st century, we uh, those of us in media had to stick together. Yeah. You know. So that's part of our worldview. Well, I'd like you to tell me in general about your background, but since you just mentioned media sticking together, talk about a little bit about your own newspaper background and then your whole upbringing, your whole real background. Yeah, who is Trip Jennings, right? Is yeah. That, yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I'm, I grew up uh, uh, not in New Mexico. I grew up in Georgia um, and um, have moved around quite a bit. I've worked at six uh, daily newspapers in five states. Uh, Georgia, California, uh, Florida, Connecticut, and now New Mexico. So a lot of my, most of my my career was spent at daily newspapers, you know, covering everything from six week, you know, there's a six week murder trial um, um, to um, cops and courts kind of stuff to 500,000 people marching in New York City, you know, mm-hmm. in 2004, the presidential uh, election. Um, to corruption in Connecticut, to corruption in New Mexico. Um, So I've had kind of an interesting career, you know, and now I'm online with this media partnership, uh, New Mexico In Depth uh, kind of coalition. Well, um, did you choose to focus on politics, or is that what just kind of keeps coming up for you? Well, you know, uh, originally I was a a local reporter. I I covered uh, like a county commission in Georgia. And so politics was only part of my coverage, but I was living in covering. I was living in Georgia and covering uh, local politics when the South went Republican. Mm-hmm. It had been Democratic, and Reagan was elected, and so I was there for the Reagan Revolution. Mm-hmm. So I saw kind of suburban counties go from Democrat to Republican, and in some ways, it kind of I understood that to be a national story, not just a local story. So I was, that kind of stuff had always interested me. I've always read uh, stories out of Washington um, about some of the larger issues because um, I was born at a time when one of the major issues um, that was on TV and in newspapers was the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And journalism played a major role in the South in in that story. And so I got a, in some ways, a front window seat on the golden age of journalism hmm. and the power um you know the, the the reports the written reports from birmingham in 63 this is before i was alive but but i still know about the the tv images and how it moved yeah. the nation yeah and so that was part of the milieu you know that i grew up in and so i think in some ways that's maybe why i like journalism and politics and policy kind of stuff well, if that was the golden age of journalism and the civil rights movement, I'm not saying we're in the Bronze Age or the Tin Age, but <laughs> what do you see as the uh, overreaching, overbiting issue, say, of this uh, 10, 20 year period? I, um, you know, as someone who started in newspapers in the 80s and, and remembered when there were th- three networks and one, mm-hmm. you know, PBS and... And Walter Cronkite. And, and Walter Cronkite. The man people trusted, right? Yeah. Um, 
and you had radio stations and you had uh, local TV stations. There wasn't cable. There wasn't the Internet. And so there was a lot of uh, people got their news from a few sources. Um, f- fast forward 30 years, there's like a, it's just an on rush of information um, that the analogy that I always use is it's like that, you know, kid in Brooklyn that you see, you know, they're dancing around a fire hydrant and you put your your mouth next to this open fire hydrant and you can't drink all that water. Yeah. Yeah. But there's too much information, and the difficulty in a functioning democracy is how do you convert that information into knowledge? Mm. I think that's part of the role of journalism, mm-hmm. and it's it's it's, it's extraordinarily dif- difficult. I've I've heard people say that we're living the analogy is is we're you know this is two or three decades after the Gutenberg press in the 15th century. That was technological innovation. Uh, the internet and a lot of things are disrupting a lot of things, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so we're in the middle of its creative constru- uh, creative destruction. Oh, um, yeah. I don't, some people say it's a golden age now. Some people say it's 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 a disaster. I I don't know. Well, I think one of the the casualties of that over information is that it's very hard to get any sense of what's true or or right. Because there's always, you know, there's uh, one side, then the other, and very stridently presented. And and, um, and so this has affected our politics today. One of the reasons I asked you to come on was you had posted an open letter. Since yes. you've been doing New Mexico politics for how long? Uh, New Mexico in depth started in 2012. Oh, New Mexico politics. Politics. 2005. Okay, when I got here. so you've seen, you've had a lot of miles watching this. <laughs> yeah. And so you wrote a letter, an open letter to the gubernatorial candidates. Yes. And I was so relieved to hear it because I would like to see a more issues-oriented campaign and mm-hmm. less, uh, um, less distortion and just like, let's, we've got hungry children. What are we going to do? Mm-hmm. Our education is bad. What are we going to do? Not mm-hmm. just you did this 27 years ago or you did mm-hmm. that. So you put some of those thoughts in. I know it's, uh, would you mind just reading us a little of it? I'd just like our audience to hear some thoughts from a veteran newsman addressing our candidates. Sure, I will read from it. Um, It's from the start of the column. I'll be blunt. The 2014 campaign for governor feels like canned reality TV. This is to Governor Martinez and to Attorney General King. Attorney General, What does the state of Governor Martinez's heart, Latino or otherwise, have to do with your vision for New Mexico? And Governor Martinez, what does it say about your confidence and your record that you're criticizing a 27-year-old vote by the Attorney General to raise taxes as a state legislator? New Mexico needs a leader with a strong vision and ability to communicate it in simple, inspiring terms that unifies, not divides, and the know-how how to make it happen. All I see is politics as usual. Okay, okay, I know what you're going to say. Negative advertising and gotcha attacks are what work with voters and many media outlets. Conflict is as old as the human species and the storyline sells. No question the system by which we elect political leaders in this country rewards 30-second sound bites and slick marketing, not substantive policy discussions and truth-telling. And I, and I kind of go on and in my column and talk about what I think are some of the major issues. I mean, persistent poverty, um, hungry children and adults who, I mean, they, they go to sleep hungry every night. Um, a really small private sector that doesn't produce a lot of high wage jobs um, and, and low graduation rates. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not really hearing them talk about this on, on the, the campaign trail. I see a lot of negative advertising well, you do mention one of the lines I like was that political games trump serious discussions of issues. And we, the populace, because people I talk to, for, and then you say America deserves, uh, New Mexico deserves better than politics as usual. People I know are arguing for their candidate, but they're talking about the issues. We'll do this for education. Mm-hmm. We'll do that for the economy. Mm-hmm. I mean, just like, mm-hmm. and is there any way that we can... From the bottom down here, the people shake this uh, establishment up and not have just, what do we have? Three debates, yeah. one in Spanish, one where the candidates in effect read 
yeah. their responses. There's nothing, you don't get any sense of who people are or that, like, let's, let's solve these problems. Uh, you know, I think that the question you ask, frankly, is one that's been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the, we have to remember that, you know, John Adams... Uh, let me just go back. Maybe Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson went at each other in really vile ways in the yes. er, in the late 18th century. And Thomas Jefferson and John Adams went at each other in the early 18th century. This is part of our DNA to really go in negative advertising and whatnot. Not to mention those political cartoons well, back then. Yeah, were... they were extraordinary. I mean, they were biting. They were sarcastic. So I'm not, I'm not naive yeah. when I suggest this kind of stuff. But... We still do talk about the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858, mm-hmm. and probably because they were an exception, because you actually did have these two just extraordinary candidates who debated one another. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I feel sometimes when I wrote this column, I, I've been around long enough. I'm a realist. I, I'm not tilting at windmills here. I'm sort of just communicating what probably my parents feel. I was raised in a home where they didn't, they weren't partisan. We didn't, I didn't know what kind of party they, I didn't, I didn't really hear them talk about partisan stuff. My dad was a small business owner, my mom was an artist, and they were, they were voted for the people. They were about solutions, mm-hmm. not this person or this person. And in some ways I was raised to think about the issues and not necessarily about the parties. Mm-hmm. And one thing that I, disturbs me is, and I've covered politics in, in, at various levels in five states across the U.S. Um, one thing that has disturbed me sometimes is always the us versus them. Yeah. Stuff. My candidate is good. Even though he did something bad, we can explain it. But your candidate did something bad, and it's all because he's bad or she's bad. Um, yeah. That doesn't sound truthful to me because human beings are, are flawed. The human condition is... It, it, we're all flawed and life is complicated and we're not perfect. Um, and uh, I wish that that could be communicated on the campaign trail. Yeah. These folks do not know all the answers. Right. I wish they could say that. Yeah. Yeah. And let's work together. Let's work together. Uh, another failure in, in perspective on this is that these are not separate, discrete issues, education, hunger, jo- the economy. They are all interconnected, and it's not a, f- a failure to say, you know, this is, there's some very deep issues at work, and, and it comes out in all these particular problems that we're working at. Let's try to get to the root of this, but we don't even get discussion of the separate issues, let alone a search, a profound search for that, the root. That is probably, you know, as you say that, I was just resonating with that because... As a young reporter, when I first started covering elections, I had this, you know, idea that here were the, you know, these were going to be, and this is going to sound so naive and funny, you know, now that I say it, it sounds, but these are going to be the, you know, the philosopher kings of our, you know, yeah. our our uh, society because they've been elected, they have, they're thinking deeply and profoundly about issues. I'm talking about back in Georgia. And what I found when I first covering politics was it was a lot of times about, you know, the party stuff. Yeah. Um, there are great people. Let me say this. There are great people in both parties. Yes. There are profound, deep thinkers in both parties. Yes. Uh, Republicans and Democrats, very good people. But um, sometimes it gets lost on the campaign trail. Yeah. Yeah, time is, is rushing by us. So uh, <laughs> I just want to remind our audience we're speaking to get today with Trip Jennings, who is the executive director of New Mexico In-Depth and has been a newsman for a very long time. So we kind of sit down, pull up our chairs by the fire, and, and talk about politics. But we're going to talk a little bit now. You also have done a long series about the role of money mm-hmm. in, in the campaigns and in New Mexico and campaign finance reform. How much money is involved, say, in this very election cycle the last uh story we put up which was uh right a more than seven and a half million dollars right now mm. and these now this is just tv ad buys right this wasn't cable tv stations it's just a local tv station so these are just ad buys purchased by campaigns and some out-of-state uh folks um Did for some of the races did I hear you one time say that it was over 19,000 ads? It's uh, 
I, over the last count, yeah, over 19,000 ads that have been booked. That's correct. Um, Governor Martinez is 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 the purchaser of the largest. She has about more than two million dollars in ads, local ads. Uh, I don't remember exactly many many thousands of ads you know purchased on her. Tom Udall is second, uh, but he's I think probably uh, a little above the million dollar mark as I recall. Um, in some ways, you know what Governor Martinez she is uh, she's got the incumbent. Um, she's got the, the, the mantle of incumbency. Uh, she's raising a lot of money, and she's using it. Politics 101 would dictate you define your opponent before they can define themselves. Mm -hmm. And you can also dampen enthusiasm of Democratic leaning vo voters by kind of taking shots at this person. Mm -hmm. that, that is not, I mean, this is pretty standard operating procedure in politics in 21st century America. This is not just her. Well, um you know there are you know people have lamented the Democrats have lamented the lack of funding that the Democratic Party has to put with the gubernatorial candidate, mm -hmm. but um, they're banking a lot banking an interesting choice of words on social media and Facebook and Instagram and all of that and I did recently interview uh, candidate King and evoked the spirit of his father Bruce King who was a premier campaigner, a much beloved governor. And um, Mr. King's campaign feels that the use of, of Facebook face-to-face -face is getting people talking again. So there's actually generations, uh, the younger in particular, who do not watch TV, who will not put up with watching those ads, and they're just doing what's called social media, new media. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know that that's a strategy for victory in the 21st yeah. century. Um, I think that that's correct. I think, you know, um, having been on Facebook for, I guess, probably more than six years now and Twitter for about six years, there are very robust political conversations on both those, you know, networks. Um, the thing that I wonder about um, with uh, social media is traditionally people who are over 50 vote more often than younger folks. Mm -hmm. How many people are on Facebook and engaged in those conversations? It may be a lot. Uh, I'm not, I, don't, I don't know about Twitter. Um, for some reason, I think of Twitter and Facebook. Uh, it's, Facebook has definitely expanded. But I still think of it as kind of a, um, if not a younger person's game, it's, it's, not, it's not like the old days when you actually went out knocking on doors. Yeah, yeah. Like the retail politics kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, face-to-face -face kind of stuff. Um, they've done a lot of polls about public financing, mm -hmm. and it's it's amazing how, regardless of party affiliation, that 80% of the people polled say that this much money in politics is bad. 79%, and this grieves me, say that all politicians are corrupt because we know so mm -hmm. many wonderful, wonderful politicians who have made the world such a better yeah. place and had them all tarred with the same brush. And then 95%, an indisputable amount, believe that it's wrong to have all of this money in politics. I mean, what could you do with that $7 million to address our real problems? You could do a lot. Yeah, a lot. And, and uh, you know, I was at a conference in Montana this May, and this was a subject, you know, of campaign finance kind of stuff. And I, I uh, everything I hear is that it is it is bipartisan. Yeah. Of of folks thinking that this is not necessarily a great thing, um, and this much money, um, because in some ways, and I, it is sort of like giving one person, and I've said this before, um, giving one person in a very crowded room a megaphone. Whereas the other person is just whispering. Yeah, good image. I like that. I like that. Um, and then there's, with the Citizens United, there's no disclosure. There's no transparency. What is the quid pro quo? What are people getting for all this money they're putting in? And ordinarily, we, you know, many other states have an ethics commission. Mm hmm it's unbelievable in this day and age that New Mexico does not have a state ethics commission. There have been lawmakers, Dee Dee Feldman, Peter Wirth, I, too many to mention, who've come session after session with this, let's have an ethics commission. 
Um, I think New Mexico may, may be one of the few, if maybe the only state without an ethics commission. I, it, maybe it's a few, uh, but, but New Mexico does lag in this area. Yeah. Um, I know that one of the reasons cited for no reason that we don't need an uh, a, a ethics commission is that you know the House and the Senate have their own ethics committees. But I don't, I don't get the sense, this is not about the people, there are many wonderful people in those chambers, yeah. but I don't get a sense that legislators can legislate themselves well yeah. sometimes. And you found that out in your work in Connecticut, which you can only speak about very briefly, but it's a wonderful story. Well, I covered uh, a governor who eventually resigned and went to federal prison over corruption, and that really sparked a move for campaign finance reform. And um, it took a major push by a journalist, Common Cause, had a national effort to bring it phone banking and whatnot, and it still took them like two sessions to get campaign finance reform through because legislators have a hard time legislating mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah. Democrats and Republicans, party, oh, yeah. party yeah. of incumbency. Yeah. Um, we've had a few scandals. Let's just dance across them. The behavioral health issue is, to me, so stunning. And I've got to compliment New Mexico in depth for p p pursuing. There were audits that decreed fraudulent behavior had occurred, and the public who paid for the audits couldn't get couldn't get them. They've been protected. And then slowly it's coming out, you know, painstakingly that this organization, we studied the audit, there was no fraud there. But 15, 15 providers of behavioral health were in effect fired and ones from Arizona were brought mm -hmm. in and, and their track record is not stellar. Yeah. And, it, and, and, you know, the attorney general has said that it would take his office, and we'll see whoever replaces him if this is going to take them long, but six and a half years uh. to get through all investigations of all 15 providers, which means, essentially, we may not get all of the audit for another six and a half years, yeah. which, which is, is uh, it's not good for the public not to get that kind of information. And it's not good for those businesses who were That's suddenly, correct. like a lightning bolt, were out of business. And then the legislature, I think it was the Legislative Finance Committee, but I'm not sure, recently recently put out a, a report saying that we've spent half a billion dollars on behavioral health and only 10 or 11 percent of it is being used effectively. That's our money. There's so much we could do with, yeah, yeah. with that. And we have uh, we have a lot of needs in this in yeah. this area in this state in that in that you know mental illness and uh, drug addiction treatment and yeah. whatnot, uh, and this is a very vulnerable population where it takes a lot of work. Yeah, it's not just programmatic in the sense you go in and get something. It takes a lot of uh, people hours. Yeah, and building trust, building, and trust. building relationships. Exactly. I had read that in Valencia County, once this change came about and the servers were fired that they went from 3,000 behavioral health clients in that county down to 1,000. Those 2,000 were not healed. They were not well. Um, in some cases, the providers that were brought in from Arizona didn't have the pharmacy licenses to continue prescribing drugs, pharmacologically, psychologically mm -hmm. necessary drugs mm -hmm. for some of these patients. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I know that you've been on this story for a while. Yeah. Do you want yes. to give us a little update? Well, most recently, uh, you know, officials from Presbyterian Medical uh, Services uh, went before uh, a panel of lawmakers and said basically that they um, they tried to give some documentation to HSD, um, the Human Services Department. I'm sorry, yes, the Human yeah, Services just... Department, um, to rebut claims in this audit that the Human Services Department used to find credible allegation of fraud against. Presbyterian Medical Services. Um, this was part of a process where P uh, Presbyterian Medical Services was trying to negotiate an agreement with Human Services Department, so HSD gave them a copy of the audit, their portion. HSD declined to take any documentation. Um, and um, what they, what happened was is the PCG audit, the Public Consulting Group audit, HSD, Human Services Department, used to find the allegations of fraud, medical, Medicaid fraud. Um, uh, Presbyterian found that uh, some, of the, uh, some of the potential overpayments to Medicaid um, were incorrect because um, there was documentation proving that they had training records and credentials that, that the auditor, state audit, auditor, didn't find. Huh. 
The headline for that story was, uh, the shake up becomes a shakedown, and they felt that they had to pay in order to stay in business. Stay in business because they 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 were they were living on reserves at that point, yeah. financial reserves. Oh, I hate to get to this at the end, but the emails here we are. We're talking about new media and how things are changing, and there are such breaking news stories about the emails, Jaime Estrada, mm-hmm. and the the stolen emails and yet people are ignoring what was in those emails mm-hmm. is almost as important as mm-hmm. how they were it was about the down steel mm-hmm. very important stuff and we won't have time to get to the las cruces da mm-hmm. uh, office but were emails destroyed that are actually public records it had to be kept it's just a swirling there are a lot of issues out there and they and they are coming out at this time because it, this is when typically these kind of issues come up during an election period yeah this is part of the election cycle you know this kind of a percolation of these kind of issues yeah. um yeah so there's, there's a lot going on in new mexico right now I, I i guess it gets back to the open letter that i sent they should be talking about serious issues instead of having negative advertising is there any way we can the voice of the people say will you please talk about what's important to us we can always say that and if enough of us kind of like uh vote with our i don't know ballots um to demand this kind of stuff mm-hmm. but in this world i of where there's so much information and there are people maybe working two or three jobs and they want to go home and, and, and not have to think deeply about stuff. I understand that. Yeah. Um, not everybody, I mean, I'm paid to try to follow these policies and it's very difficult even as a full-time person. Um, we can hope. Yes. Right? Well, we'll hope and that's all we have time left to do. I really appreciate you as a journalist, and I'm just so glad that you came to spend time with us today. Our guest is Trip Jennings, the executive director of New Mexico In-Depth. Thank you for sharing your ideas, your thoughts, and feelings with us today. uh, Lorene, again, thank you for inviting me. I'm Lorene Mills. This has been Report from Santa Fe. Remember, Election Day is November 4th. Your voice is your vote. Thank you for joining us on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.